My name is Laura Caprera and I am the owner and founder of Stellafly Social Media here in West Michigan. And today we are joined by the fabulous Douglas Rushkoff, author of Program or Be Programmed. So welcome to Grand Rapids. Hi, good to be here. Thank you. Um, why don't we just start out by asking you, you know, how you started, how you got interested in, in you know, the internet and computers and everything that you do? Well, honestly, it was um, in sixth or seventh grade, they uh, somehow got computers in our school. This is in the 70s. And they didn't have like computers, but they had these things called terminals, which were just like a, a sort of like a typewriter with a roll of paper in it. And they had a wire and it hooked it up to some computer somewhere else in the world. And, uh, or in the building probably. And they taught us some, some kids in the little club, some real basic computer commands. And at that point I saw that you, you would save computer files and you'd, you'd either save them as like a read-only file that people could read and couldn't touch or a read-write file that people could read and change or a no read at all, that no one's allowed to see it but you. And I went home that day and I was just thinking, gosh, how much of the rest of the world is sort of read, read-only or read-write? And I was a TV kid, you know, like a Brady kid. You know, so, and I was looking at television that afternoon and I thought, well, less is a weird thing. This is television, but I'm only allowed to watch this. I'm not allowed to change this. There's no input. There's no, but this other medium that's coming up, this computer would let me actually change what's there. So I started looking at the whole world in terms of programs. And, and I didn't get, ever get good at programming, but I was kind of profoundly affected by that. I, the way I imagine you know, people would be affected taking like a psychedelic for the first time. And you look at the world and it's all, oh my gosh, it's all up for grabs. You know, I went, I was a New Yorker. I went out in the New York City streets and looked at the grid pattern of New York City and I said, this is a grid. It, it could have been anything. I always thought grid city meant grid, but there are these other cities that they don't do on grid. And who chooses that? And when does it get chosen? And how does it get locked down? So for me, this journey of the last 30, 40 years has been about looking at what in our world is a genuine pre-existing condition of nature, and what is a program? What has been put here? You know, and I've been looking at all different media, you know, from you know, television and computers and even the printing press. I've looked at Judaism, and I've looked at business and corporatism and currency, and all these different systems to see you know, what is set in stone and what's up for discussion. And if it's not up for discussion, why isn't it? Is it, is it being locked down by some nefarious people who don't want us talking about it because they know the minute we do, we're going to want to change things or what? So I've been writing all these books and talking and doing documentaries and different things, you know, all about these sort of this, this main issue about what in our reality is open source and what isn't and why. And with the open source, um, you're a big fan of open source big proponent of open source? Yeah, or at least to, to have a good reason why something's not, sure. Right, how do you think that that, um, if everything were to be open source, how that would affect um, competition between businesses? Well, in some sense, everything is open source. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just whether it's locked down mm -hmm. or not. I mean, so you look at things that, that we decide aren't open source, China doesn't respect that right. it's not, mm -hmm. or Iran won't respect that it's not. So even if we lock things down and say, oh, well, you know, genetic engineering is too dangerous, so we should just have this done in science, special scientific labs that are approved, other countries in North Korea, wherever, well, not that they're doing that great genetic research there right now, but anywhere else can do it. Um, I think open source ultimately is good for competition. That's why big companies don't want it. You know, if you have a company like Microsoft, which at one point sort of owned the operating system universe, they don't want operating systems to be open source because then anybody can tinker with it and make it better. And then what do they, what does Microsoft still own? So, you know, an open source universe would be, in some ways, the true libertarian uh, universe. That's where everybody can do anything and keep, and keep improving and you're just going to keep changing who provides you with stuff in order to go to the one who's you know, got the most competitive answer. 
Do you have in your in your resources the person that you think is, you know, like you were saying, if, if things are open source, then anybody can make them better? And, you know, I think that there's an assumption that, you know, th those people are at Apple or Microsoft uh -huh. or, you know, even at Facebook. Who do you think are, like, the pioneers on those types of things that are really good at it, the, the, those that are making big changes? Well, I don't know. I don't know how popular they are here, but you know, I look at. Uh, I draw a lot of inspiration from the occupiers. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I know they're not at a company, but uh, the the occupiers sort of said, "Well, wait a minute. If our political system is broken and all this stuff is bankrupt and none of this stuff works, what if we, rather than trying to work through this convoluted system and raise money to blah 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 blah, what if we just say?" Things are changing now, mm -hmm. as of this moment. In other words, the, the, the beauty to me of that whole word, occupy, is that rather than working towards change, some you know, eye on the prize, you know, a, a climactic campaign towards justice, um, you know, the very great 1960s, 70s style of political activism, they just say, what if we just occupy the reality that we're living in right now in the way that we think is appropriate? So you look at the kinds of innovations that they came up with, whether they borrowed from the ancient Greeks and did their general assembly where they can draw consensus between hundreds of people at once or break into working groups or create a kind of a trusted network of different activities. And people think the occupation or Occupy is over. You know, I just came from, from hurricane devastated New York where Occupy Sandy was the most effective way of getting relief and information. You know, or now they're doing um, Occupy Debt where they're buying you know, pennies on the dollar the same way that credit companies buy credit of other people and then collect on it. They're buying debt and relieving it, which is just sort of confounding everybody. So if you buy, you know, if you spend $5 and buy someone's $250 of somebody's debt and then you go, okay, rather than collecting on it, just, it's gone. Mm -hmm. you know, what does that do to people with medical bills and, and student debt? It just erases it. So it's kind of, uh, uh, I think they're very innovative and in just in their uh, kind of practical, um, no heroes kind of approach to just solving social problems. How do they get their message out there? I, I, you know, I don't think, it, the interesting thing is, I don't think they have to get their message out there. You know, I think they just do. You know, that, that's, the funny thing is, you know, they did the Occupy, they were in Zuccotti Park in New York and all these other mm -hmm. places, and the media came, mm -hmm. and they were all putting the mics in front of mm -hmm. saying, what do you want? What are you demanding? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that's, we don't really demanding, we're not, that's not what, mm -hmm. and the media's, ah, they don't know what they're doing, they mm -hmm. don't know. And um, no, it's just that their uh, brand or style of social activism wasn't consonant with the, you know, the nine second soundbite requirement of mm -hmm. CNN. So mm -hmm. it's like, oh, if you can't say it in nine seconds, mm -hmm. then there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. And no, it turns out, no, it's, if you can't say it in nine seconds, it's because there is something there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of stuff you can say in nine seconds that doesn't end up leading to anything. You know, look at the presidential debates. Look at how that, at how that works. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and the reason I ask that is because, you know, we had a very small Occupy movement in Grand Rapids, and then they'd show up if it was warm out. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, I mean, it, it obviously has... Um, affected you and you find you find it effective and you are impressed by that in New York so um, I think that you know they may not feel that they need to spread their message but how could they teach other cities to have that same effectiveness well, I think without you do leaving it, New York I mean you model it rather than broadcast it mm -hmm. I mean that's the beauty of the internet as a medium versus television mm -hmm. you know on the internet you can have your to start anyway, your Facebook page, hopefully it links out really mm -hmm. quickly because mm -hmm. Facebook is kind of collapsing as mm -hmm. a means of, of disseminating information for free. But you know, you have you have websites, there's websites of you know, of just collecting all the stuff, all the different models that different Occupy movements have tried, mm -hmm. so that people can go, oh look, they did this, that would work here, or they did that, that would work over here. You know, there's wikis, which is just a kind of a way of uh, uh, sharing information, everybody can add on to it. Um, so there's lots of just repositories of experience mm -hmm. that can be disseminated laterally rather than, you know, this style where we, you know, come up with something yeah. and then broadcast it yeah. 
out. You know, it's just, it's, this is important too, but they're, they're different. I mean, and for me, what they're doing, just like what the open source um, computer movement is doing or the permaculture land movement and organic farming mm -hmm. and all that, mm -hmm. is they're, you, they're really, uh, uh, I guess, giving credence to what theorists that, that I look up to, guys like Buckminster Fuller, who was mm -hmm. a great um, uh, mathematician, technologist, and thinker, and architect, you know, the, the 50s and 60s, he would always say that uh, you know, the problems that we're facing as a civilization are not intrinsic to our civilization. They're problems of design. You know, so as long as we can understand that all these various systems that we're using and that the world we're in has design elements to it, then we can take it upon ourselves to redesign them in ways that actually work for people rather than crush them. So if you look at the design, say, of uh, central bank dominated corporate capitalism. Right? That's not to say capitalism isn't good or free trade isn't good or markets aren't good. It's to say that, okay, we've got this banking system that really dominates how money is produced and where mm -hmm. it goes. We use a kind of money mm -hmm. that has a real bias towards interest and paying up to the people who lent it and all that. You say, well, wait a minute. Is our, is our economic problem because we're too competitive, because our businesses don't work, because we're not employed enough? Or is there something about the design of money and the way our economy moves that is hampering our ability to move to the next stage? And that's a lot of my work was about that, looking at, OK, we're using a 13th century printing press era economic operating system to underlie a 21st century digital era economy. They don't work. They're not compatible. It's the OS is broken. So, who's allowed to go and redesign money? What other kinds of monies are there? And that's when you've got to do some history. And you say, well, what kinds of monies were there before this one was legally made the only one? And how did those other ones work? And that's the kind of thing. That's the kind of approach that hackers and open source people tend to have much more than those who just, you know, work within systems. Wow, my head's swimming now. That's. A lot of information, but yeah, but it's why I don't like to say, "Oh, I'm this digital guy" or "I'm a no, technology," because I don't, you know, I believe really in program, mm -hmm. but I don't really know how to do mm -hmm. it. You know, I know how to do it enough to know that, oh my gosh, it opens these doors. You know, so I, I, I can, I can now I can see that it's like, wow, we can reprogram anything, and if I can share that insight, if people can look at the systems that they're in and say, "Oh, I don't have to be a slave to this system. I can actually rewrite that system." Mm -hmm. That's consonant with all of Western civilization. It's consonant with the Judeo-Christian myth. I mean, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. These people who were, you know, members of a death cult in Egypt, they escape, they go to the desert, and they say, oh, wait a minute, these laws we've been following, we can write them ourselves. So Moses gets his father-in-law, Yithro, mm -hmm. and they sit down and they say, let's figure out a new legal system that actually will promote ethics among people. So it's as old as, as our Bible, this, this insight. And when we forget it, you know, after three, four hundred years, we got to just revive it again, free ourselves of whatever is, you know, kind of enslaving our, our little brains and, mm -hmm. and open it up again. So, I mean, it's, it, I sense then that you feel that there is a movement happening. I mean, it, especially with what you're seeing at home. And um, do you think, I mean, without getting too political, do you think that this election, this last election, showed some indications of, of these old old things not working and more people wanting to figure out how to make it work? I mean, what was, I mean, it, was, was, so, it was very confusing for it me. It was all so of it. confusing. The whole thing was so confusing because, um, I don't know, Obama was saying the things I thought Romney was going to say, and Romney was saying the things I thought Obama was going to say. And then I'm figuring neither one is saying the things that they mean because they're just trying to appeal to these other people. So right. it was just, I was so confused by the whole thing. Um, so I don't, I don't know that it was a fair, uh, kind of wasn't a fair fight on a certain level. On, on some level, I want to see like, uh, you know, Dennis Kucinich against, you know, uh, uh, against Rand or something, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, or what was his name? Uh, uh, was it the, the, the Ron Paul. Right. You know, just like, let's just really, let's just cut it, cut loose. It all let's down. just see mm -hmm. it there, and then have them both go, all right, let's do it together, you know, and figure it out. Or just like the Green Party against the Libertarians. Let's just really, you know, cut loose here. Um, 
No, there's some, the, the thing that gave me hope was that there wasn't uh, some awful, terrible, corrupt voter suppression fraud thing that mm -hmm. we kind of managed to, mm -hmm. even though, you know, poor people had to wait seven hours and rich people didn't, at least it kind of still worked in a way that we can go, all right, we got to really deal with this now. Um, you know, so it wasn't, that gave me some hope. And the fact that it seemed that the, the public wasn't swayed by the more uh, apocalyptic, hyperbolic qualities of, of the debate, that the public kind of wanted a level-headed thing, and they tended to get rid of the people that were using weird, extreme scare tactics. Mm -hmm. Like the thing of like, oh, if you elect these people, then gay people are going to start getting married. That didn't really frighten people that much. So and I'm kind of hopeful. It. Yeah. For that. Well, and I think, you know, for me, um, you know, I think you and I kind of grew up in the same era. Um, you know, coming and watching very conservative and then, you know, things, I mean, things just change. And that's yeah. how this movement happens. And I, for me, I actually, you know, from listening to both sides and then paying close attention to it on the social media networks, mm -hmm. watching stories break, watching videos come out, you know, different things. I think at the at the end of the day, um, what was refreshing for me is that people really went with their heart mm -hmm. um, in terms of what they wanted for themselves and their families. And it goes back to that that whole notion of you know, the occupiers um, saying, you know, this isn't working anymore. So how do we give, how do we make an alternative? Because if you don't make an alternative, then you're just always going to be stuck in that yeah. same thing. I mean, I feel like, funny, I wrote about, wrote about this in a book called Life, Inc., where I was looking at kind of the corporatization of people and society and all. And I feel like people make this kind of silent equation or calculation in their head where they think, you know, can I earn enough money doing what I do to insulate myself from the reality of the world, mm -hmm. right? Can I send my kid to private school? Can I get enough security around my house? Can I get into a neighborhood right on? And as more and more people realize that they can't earn their way out of this mess, they've got to choose the alternative, which is, well, rather than make enough money to insulate myself from the dark, evil world, can I make the dark, evil world a place that I would like to live? You know, and it's such an easier solution to the problem. It's like, well, what if I just make a world that I don't have to insulate myself from? So I feel like as people make that kind of decision, um, you know, they become more aware of their community. They become sort of cognizant, oh, well, if I took fifteen or $20,000 of my effort and applied it towards making my public school a better place, then would I not have to think about sending my kid to private school? You know, how, how, do, I, how do I reverse that? And as people slowly reverse that, you start to see you know, towns coming back, people buying locally, considering alternative currencies, volunteering for things that actually make a difference. You know, and then that changes the real issues in the world. You're buying from community-supported agriculture instead of from you know, the, the big agri company and mm -hmm. all of a sudden the environment's doing better because you're not shipping chard across the country in a Mack truck. And so these, these incremental changes really do um, have kind of system-wide effects. Do you think, I know um, with West Michigan, um, being a person that does social media, representing different clients, um, a, a lot of the ways that people in our community find out about nonprofits and about you know schools, I actually do um, social media management for our Grand Rapids public school system. Um, mm -hmm. They learn a lot about that on Facebook and Twitter. That's our community uses it. Does, does New York use platforms like Facebook and Twitter to communicate? It's a much bigger city. Um, are, do, do most people get their news and their information from TV, from print? Um, how does that work? You know, I mean, I guess it depends on the demographic. I mean, in, in, in my crowd, most people get their news, they get their links from Twitter and then follow it mm -hmm. you know, to a news story. But um, I mean, New York is a, is a tricky market, as it were, because mm -hmm. it is a national market at the same time that it's local. So you kind of feel if you're watching you know, the, the CBS Evening News, it kind of feels like your local news because it's yeah. coming out of Rock Center or exactly. some place you know, mm -hmm. in New York. Um, but you know we've got our, our our local news too, and 
we've got a city that, you know, we've got a mayor that communicates pretty well through, through media about, about what's going on. It's, it's, a, uh, it's kind of a, it's, it's a unique media, a, a media equation there, I think, compared to a place that has more of a sense of its own place. You know, in New York, you kind of feel generic on a certain level. Yeah. You know, it used to be very New York-y. There yeah. was industry in New York. Now mm -hmm. it just feels like you're in, it's like New York, L.A., San Francisco. You're part of now the sort of generic urban, uh, urban matrix. But uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, I was going to say a lot of media production. You know, that people are, uh, uh, and I think, feel like this is all over. People feel much more like they're media producers than just consumers now. Even if they're just passing on a tweet or writing a blog post that has two sentences at the beginning and the end of something someone else has said. Mm -hmm. I think they feel like you know, the way we consume media is by re-expressing it, mm -hmm. you know, passing it, mm -hmm. um, which is at least a baby step towards actually speaking oneself. Yeah, well, I, I, know, for, I know with the work that I do, um, I don't even honestly bother following our local media mm. because it's you know it's out there. But um, New York really does fall like right into the same category as you know CNN, um, you know as some other breaking tweet um, Twitter handles that I follow. So New York, yeah. NBC. Although I'll tell you though, when the hurricane happened just two weeks ago. The New York Times, which is trying so hard to be the national paper and compete with Murdoch and all that, they kind of weren't there mm -mm. on this hour story. Mm -hmm. And my sports radio station, you have the fan here. I think it's everywhere, but you know the fan, 66 AM, is like where I get my news about the Knicks and the teams I care mm -hmm. about. right? Mm -hmm. And those were the guys who were talking about, where's the lights up? Where are they down? Where do you get your generator? What's going on? It was like our sports radio became the advocates of of us, you know, and you know, the, the AOL has this thing called the patch that's like everywhere now. It's sort of AOL is trying to have local media on the net. Um, people are turning to the patch and the River Towns Press. So it's, I live in this town called Hastings on Hudson. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a little town, but our little paper becomes a hub of, you know, our information on the town Facebook page. Although Facebook's got, you know, Facebook doesn't disseminate its messages and we've got to pay to get disseminate. I mean, there are these awful stories like a memorial site for some kid, you know, and it's got 40 followers. And then they ask the dad, you know, on the one year anniversary, he wanted to say, OK, it's the one year anniversary. We're going to hold the ceremony here. And Facebook gives this message to him that says, well, you could reach, you know, 18 of his followers unless you want to pay 30 bucks and you can reach the other 30 of them. And he's like, oh, my God, you're going to make me pay to reach the people who want to go to my kid's funeral. It's like, that's anti-social social networking. It is, but now, you know, not to get off topic, but honestly, from, from your perception of that, is that that's, that's the, the ongoing question to social media managers like myself that has, have watched our engagement level go from pretty good engagement to all of a sudden just one day, it just dropped off. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way now Pay that up, you can baby. do it. So Zuckerberg is smart, you know, he wants to monetize everything and, and people are doing it, but do you believe it's effective? Because the people I'm hearing from are saying that they are getting hits, but they're getting hits from I don't. India I think it's, and different I think countries that are the, irrelevant. It is the greatest corporate fuck up since New Coke. Yeah. Only this one might be permanent. You know, this one might be permanent because even if he undoes it, right? If he goes, oh, I'm sorry, it was a mistake. Can't and then, put the genie We back. know now that he can. Mm -hmm. And we know now that he would if mm -hmm. given the chance. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of, he, he does these bad things and he pulls back, but then slightly. No, I'm, I'm off it. I am off it. You know, I've got, and, and it was a lot of work. You know, I've got seven or eight or 9,000 Facebook fans, as mm -hmm. they're called, which is people who want to know, when am I coming to town? Yep. When is my book coming mm -hmm. out? What's my latest CNN article? You know, what am I doing? Um, and they're saying here, you reach this many people unless you pay us. Well, yeah, okay. So when my next book comes out in March, present shock, you could all buy it at Amazon now. When my next book comes out, I am going to send one Facebook paid message. I'll pay the 40 or $50, whatever it is that they want for me to get. And I'm going to let people know I'm paying for this message. It's the only time I can do it. <laughs> I. I'm an author. We don't get paid a lot anymore. Right. You know, um, this is it. And then, and farewell. You know, <laughs> and yeah. farewell. And then just end, end the page. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the newest thing for sure. And it's, um, 
it's perplexing to me. So you, I have to wonder if, you know, going back to what you were saying with Occupy, if all the um, people that are doing social media management for companies, and I, I do it for very small businesses, but the big ones, if nobody does it, then what happens? Exactly. What happens? We move on. Right. GM moved on. You know, they were one of the first ones. Mm -hmm. They were just like, screw this. This yeah, is pointless. I mean, if you don't pay it, then people will have to. And it's not effective. Mm -hmm. You know, so as they realize it's not, I mean, where, where Facebook could have and should have made its money, only it's not enough to justify its valuation, which is why I said it was never going to work, is selling our social graph was valuable, right? Who, is all, who are all my friends? How do I think? What do I buy? What do I share? Mm -hmm. That's valuable to mm -hmm. social market research, to, to Axiom, to Claritas, to, to, to all of the great uh, uh, consumer analytics companies. But even though that's a multi-billion dollar business, it's not you know, a hundred or two hundred billion dollar business. So Facebook can't achieve its valuation, can't, can't justify its valuation without finding new revenue sources. And unfortunately, you know, I'm not going to be one of them. Now, do you think you'll find it, though? No, he won't. You don't think he so? Won't. He doesn't have to, though. He got his money. That's true. They're releasing 800 million shares or something tomorrow. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Twitter, then. Twitter. That's, that's your favorite. I mean, yeah, you know, Twitter. I mean, there's Google Plus, there's Instagram, Pinterest, you know, that came and went for me. Yeah. Instagram is, you know, it's visual, it's in, oh, sort it's of engaging. Pin interest. I never pin heard interest, it said. Yeah. I never heard it said. I always say Pinterest. Pinterest, I but know, But it's right? not. Do other people say that? That's yeah. funny. So I'm not, you know, but. That's funny. Which yeah, one do you actually think is uh, Twitter, the most effective? Twitter works. The, the issue with Twitter is now Twitter kind of closed its API, which means now you can't kind of Twitterfy things yourself. You can't take its program and use it. You can't like install it into to various LinkedIn things. And into yeah. the other places you so, could post to. Because they want to be the hub mm -hmm. so they can advertise and do mm -hmm. things that they do. And I understand that, but I don't know what that's gonna do or how long they're gonna let us do what we're doing. The functionality of Facebook is going to be recreated, whether it's by Quora or Diaspora or one of the other services coming up. And the functionality of Twitter, in theory, could also be repeated. But I feel like um, Twitter is such a little, Twitter's a little utility. Twitter's like a Google window. Twitter's like a, a thing. It kind of works in a different way um, that I don't think it's going to get as convoluted and screwed up as, as Facebook got. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to still um, use that until it, it until it's broken or until they break it on purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so do you, do you get uh, probably get a lot of engagement through that with, with the things that you do with your followers? Yeah, it's good. You know, and it's a way for someone, in some ways, and I hate to admit it, in some ways they get a faster, better answer to something than by emailing me. Mm -hmm. You know, if they tweet, you know, Rushka, what do you think of this such and such currency or what do you think of this? You know. If it's something that I think is of interest to a lot of people, I'll try to create a little tweet or I'll write a piece on it and then say, here's the end, here's my response to you, and, mm -hmm. and link to it. Well, I could talk to you for hours, but they're going to make me stop now. So that concludes our talk with Douglas Ruskoff. Thank you. Thanks for coming to Grand Rapids.